There has never been more choice for fans of cinema. Movie studios and streaming services are releasing content every week. Yet somehow, to three guys living in the UK, the choice of what to watch has never been more difficult. Led by celluloid junkie Dave, industry professional Jim, and sci-fi nerd Fish, the guys chart the rise and fall of the 1990s from the very beginning in the spirit of education, conversation, and wanting to learn as much as possible about what was cool then, what's still cool now, and everything in between. We invite you all to take the journey through the 90s. Repeated. Hi, my name's Dave, and I'm a self-appointed film historian um, and host of the TV show, the <laughs> podcast. You wish the 90s. it was a TV show. I wish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Primetime, Nickelodeon, 6 p.m. Nickelodeon. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's my that's my that's lane. Your peak. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Dave and I'm a self-appointed a film historian uh, and host of the 90s Repeated, a podcast that hopes to go through the past to uncover the future. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the goal of the podcast is to go through the 1990s one season at a time and rewatch all the awesome films from that time period and have a nice jolly old conversation about them. Um, I'm going to be joined by my two co-hosts, Jim. Hello. Film industry professional. He's down in the he's down in the dirt, guys. Working it, grafting Look at the coal for my sins. Real, real, real film production. Um, and our enthusiastic newcomer, Fish, who by and large has not seen lot <laughs> most of the movies we'll be talking about. So you get that fresh yeah. perspective. <laughs> no business being on a movie podcast whatsoever. <laughs> but here I am. So the, the way the show works is um, we, we pick a movie. Uh, we're starting in the 1990s, but on this episode we're doing a special one-off introductory episode for the 1995 film Heat, um, mostly because we really wanted Fish to watch it because he hadn't seen it, and we didn't want to wait five seasons worth of this podcast before he got to see it. Yeah. Um, but uh, the way it would normally work is we will start in 1990, uh, we will go through the season starting in January all the way through to December and watch the big releases one movie at a time. Um, we start off by gen talking generally about the movie with the, the, the acts, so we just break down the movie into three parts, act one, two, and three, and talk about each act as a whole. Um, during our conversation about the acts, uh, we'll be talking about characters, cinematography, music, sound, the usual things you talk about when talking about a movie. You will hear some uh, sound effects, um, so just a little bit of explanation around those. Occasionally you're going to hear a sound effect called Trivia Bomb. Trivia Bomb! And that is when one of us has dropped a interesting or cool piece of trivia that we hadn't heard before. You're also going to hear a uh, the woke police siren. Freeze! Woke police. Now the woke police siren is uh, a siren that is played whenever we talk about something a little bit problematic, or maybe one of us says something we really shouldn't have in the edit, and the woke police come in and save us from being cancelled through the whole of Twitter. So it's just a little bit of protection, it's a little bit of a joke. We understand these are some these are quite sometimes sensitive times and on a free form podcast like this where you're talking for a couple of hours, you can sometimes, especially if you mean, speak without thinking. So the work police are there to save us. We've already had to buy a new siren. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other one is we the other sound effect we have is sick reference, bro. This is when one of us makes uh, a reference to another movie or uh, a tie to another movie that we think is pretty fun. That's uh, that will pop up as well. Sick reference, though, bro. Oh, thanks, bro. Dude, your references are out of control. Everyone knows that. He's here. And moves on the street allow nothing to be in your life that you cannot walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you spot the heat around the corner well, my life's a disaster zone because i spend all my time chasing guys like you around the block i do what i do best i take scores you do what you do best I'm trying to stop guys like me so uh heat came out on uh, the 15th of december 1995 number one on the charts guys any guesses 1995 december 
<laughs> any any guesses? Uh, any guesses about who was like? In, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's just the nineties. Is this it's pre the 90s. Spice Girls? It's December. 95, I was going to say it'd be take that maybe Spice Girls. It was Michael Jackson Earth Song. So imagine Michael Jackson Earth Song playing as you wander into the cinema to watch Michael Mann's Heat. Um, <laughs> Michael Jackson's last last big hit was that probably. I think it probably was his last big hit. Yeah, yeah, it probably was. And then also we were going through at that stage the divorce of Prince Charles and Diana. That was very much in the news oh. and and happening at the time. Um, I think it's fair to say we were all fairly young when this movie came out. I don't have any strong memories of uh, seeing the movie. Yeah, well, I don't have any memories no. of seeing the movie because I ha- no. hadn't seen it <laughs> until yesterday. Um, so I guess the other thing we would like to do is uh, your opinion of the movie before going in to watch it then. Uh, Jim Fish, we'll, we'll start with you. Fish, so kind of what your vibe was going into the movie, your excitement level, what you knew about it before you decided to go in and watch it. It's like a black hole for me. I, 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 I know there's a film called Heat. I know Pacino and De Niro are in it. Uh, and I'd never seen it. And that's as much information as I had. I knew it was lauded as one of the greatest crime film drama thrillers of all time and for whatever reason yet again with me basically if it hasn't got lasers dragons dwarves <laughs> lightsabers or time travel i'm not interested <laughs> and, and this didn't have any of that so uh yeah and I, I never planned on watching it did the fact though that pacino and de niro were in it together give you any kind of excitement because that was obviously the one of the big huge things about when this movie came out was like the first time they were kind of on screen together yeah i wouldn't say uh, <laughs> excitement i'd say interest so i was a little okay. bit confused because they were in the godfather part two together yes together but they'd never shared a scene yeah they were playing yeah so i hadn't time I, think, I think i hadn't realized that they'd never shared a scene but obviously logically of course they didn't um mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, no, it, I mean, interest rather than excitement, I would say, okay. going into okay. this. Was what, sorry? It, you're just mildly interested. <laughs> yeah, just just, just okay. interested. I mean, how, how, I can't be excited about a film I know nothing about, really, true, can I? Uh, okay. you, you guys well, are definitely okay. far you more heard excited. It, you heard it, trailer guys. Give up. <laughs> oh, yeah, Give up now, go home. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I, I didn't even watch the trailer, so yeah. Nothing. I went in completely and utterly blind. Okay, cool. Well, that's nice. It's a blank slate. Yeah. And then, Jim, I, I suppose you'd seen it a few times, but how excited were you to watch it again? Or I'd seen it a few times, because I think the first time I saw it was when we were at university together, Dave, probably. Cool. It was a little bit later for me. Um, and I've watched it maybe, I don't know, four or five times since. Uh, yeah. It's, it's strange. It's one of those movies where, apart from like the big standout scenes... I mm. never remember that much about the rest of the movie. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like watching it again. It always sort of is new in a way because, and I don't know if that's a good thing because it means, is it not very memorable? I, I don't know. I I had the thought while watching the movie too, Jim, in the sense that I consider myself a film person and this is a movie I've seen lots of times, but I think it's just, you change as you get older, we all change. And I just feel like rewatching movies is becoming more of a joy as I get older, because I just feel like I'm watching it again with fresh eyes and I'm just a bit more understanding, you know, and we'll get into it as it goes on. I just feel like I understand a lot more like the emotional character stuff more now as like an adult than when yes. I did when I was a kid, where I, when I was a kid, like all the character stuff just kind of washes over you mm-hmm. and you just kind of enjoy the action yeah. stuff. Yeah. Can I just ask, uh, can I just going back to Fish, uh, I mean, when you put the movie on and, you know, the opening credits started rolling, seeing this, like, cast list come up, did that then get you excited a little bit going into it? Oh, yeah. (laughs) The cast is one of the first things that that got me. I mean, it was amazing. Obviously, you've got De Niro and Pacino. And I'd sort of... I hadn't... I I did know, but I'd forgotten that Val Kilmer was in it. So I was like, oh, that's awesome. But then they just keep coming. It's like, oh, that's the guy from Armageddon. Uh, hmm. Oh look, he's in The Simpsons. Oh, Tone Lock <laughs> from Ace Ventura's in it. Um, <laughs> si- it si- Tone Lock, man. Yeah, Silence of the Lambs guy. Magua from The Last of the Mohicans. Machete. Oh, th- bloody hell, it's Padme. Like it was just <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. They just kept coming thick and fast. It was incredible. I loved it. 
So yeah, what a cast! It's amazing. Um, well, well, let's go. Let's go straight into the into the movie then. I mean, I just say that I was very excited to rewatch this, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go straight in. So we're going to talk about section one of the movie first. So the section one is uh, we'll just start with the characters first of all. So we'll break down who the characters are, who they are, what we kind of think about them. Mm. So um, we'll start with Al Pacino. Um, so Fish, how would you describe Vince Hanna, the Al Pacino character in this He's movie? He's utterly fucking unhinged, isn't he? Like, what on <laughs> earth is Pacino doing in this movie? Like, it's big. It's a big performance, right? Yeah, but there's no, there's no subtlety. It's extremes. He's either completely like calm and chilled out or he's like rah, rah, a great big ass rah. what on earth is going on i mean it's is this i think that's is this it, a, it, a, a key pacino performance is this what he's sort of remembered for well this this is the thing though and i think this is like the movie where you've got pacino and de niro being the most pacino and the most de niro right, and it's yeah. kind of like whenever anyone does like an impression of either of them it's from this movie i would think yeah I mean, it is incredible. Yeah, this this did mark a turn in Al Pacino because there's two kind of phases of Al Pacino. There's the early phase where he's kind of quiet and meek, and um, and that was like the 70s where he's doing Godfather, he's doing Dog Day Afternoon, um, and Serpico. And then something happens in the 90s where he just changes. Yeah, and he becomes big, loud, bombastic Al, and it's like this movie, Scent of a Woman, um, <laughs> and and um, yeah, and that's kind of what happened. Why'd I get mixed up with that bitch? Cause she got a great ass! And you got your head all the way up it! Uh, look, maybe Wait, I should- Shut up, Ralph! Shut up! It's unbelievable. It's all, It's almost like he, Al Pacino, right? He can't act, all right? Just imagine this, right? He can't act. <laughs> just, just hypothetically. What, what, what? Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Al Pacino, he's, a, ba- he's a bad actor, right? Good, um, not good fellas. This is a hypothetical <laughs> this question. This is hypothetical, right? And I keep. It's so a hypothetically. I'm imagining a world where Al Pacino is a bad yeah, actor. Yeah, yeah. And the Godfather okay. was a complete fluke, right? His character, <laughs> Michael, right. It, it was just like complete fluke. He fluked it. it. It was all done in the edit. And he's like, oh shit, no. Oh, oh I've been busted. And, and, and I can't act. I need to do something. I'll, I'll go over the top. Like what have we got? Hey, baby. Well, so there he is. goes bonkers instead. I told you when we hooked up, baby, that you were going to have to share me with all the bad people and all the ugly events on this planet. Okay, so I, 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 think, I think there's a risk. I think there's a risk then uh, 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 because those big boombastic scenes are so big and memorable and that's kind of the meme and the gifts that get repeated. I think there is a risk that we, are, we do forget. There are smaller moments in this movie where Al is doing some pretty cool What are you, thing. a fucking owl? Um, <laughs> Um, so they're not in this. They're not in necessarily the start of the movie, but later on when we get to the cafe scene, uh, that's a very cool kind of small performance between that was excellent. De Niro and Pacino. Yes, but I don't want to jump ahead to that just yet. Sure, but there is there is um, a reason for Pacino's mm-hmm. outlandish performance, or you know these he outbursts. Act. It only <laughs> came out recently, didn't it? <laughs> it's not because he can't act. Yeah, it only came out recently, and I think Al Pacino did a. He was doing some kind of press conference for, for 15th anniversary, I think, or 25th anniversary of this movie. Right. Or okay. Or 35th anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think it'd been it had originally been written into the script, um, but it got taken out. And it was a conversation that happened between him and Michael Mann, where his character is supposed to be essentially he's he's chipping cocaine. You know, in his life, he is a cocaine addict. So that kind of explains these sort of mad outbursts that he has because he's basically just constantly on this sort of slight level of being coked up the whole time i don't know if this has gotten out much i don't know if i've ever said it but i i might be breaking the law now but i'll say it um the character i played is is a guy he's a, he's been around he's done a lot of stuff and he also uh chips cocaine this give me all you got Listen, Give me all you got! And I, I always thought that that was a, um, a choice we made, and, and, but yet not, not showing it. But there is a scene in it where it goes by really quick, but which we never, get, never got into the film. And I've always wanted to say uh, sometimes, just so you know where some of the behavior is coming from. <laughs> Um, but no, as a character, then Vince Hanna. So we 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 are obviously he's a guy that values his work over his personal life. He's you know he's he he ignores the people in his life. He's out. He's 
doing he's doing, he's obviously has trouble in his marriage so just just focusing on the beginning of the movie we're kind of seeing that he's with his wife and then he's out the door uh and then she's pumping some pills she's a bit unhappy clearly i don't know if there's like a moment where she as soon as he's out the door she takes some valium or something and uh, yeah. um so that, that that's that's the kind of uh, we immediately get a sense that this is the guy that's got some trouble at home then we're introduced to um the criminals very quickly so wayne grow is the kind of new recruit this kind of guy just real quickly um, was he in con yeah. air no, no. Oh, okay, forget that. Cause I, no. I was convinced for a little while. That was that... Nicolas Cage. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but <laughs> the guy who he says put the bunny back in the box to, that's not Wayne uh, Grove. No, no, okay. no. I, I know who you mean though, but yeah, it's not this guy. Hi guys, Dave here. I need to step in because Wayne Grove actor Kevin Gage does actually have an uncredited role in the movie Con Air as the aggressive guy at the bar that gets Nicolas Cage sent down. So props to Fish but uh, not the role he calls out in the podcast. Correction, trivia bomb over. Um, so yeah, he's kind of the new recruit that's come into this gang of criminals. Uh, the gang of criminals led by Robert De Niro. And we've got as two henchmen or two right-hand guys. We've got Tom Sizemore from Saving Private Ryan. You might recognize him. Oh, he was another uh, one. And... Yeah, I just, I just put that... <laughs> when I wrote down a little note yeah. about who the actors were, I was like, oh yeah, that guy who's a dick in everything. <laughs> big 90s Tom actor Sizemore. Tom Sizemore yeah, yeah, One of the, yeah, yeah. so he's like you're saving Private Ryan this movie and True Romance he shows up in right. and um, and we've also got Val Kilmer obviously he's yeah, uh, yeah. another big big 90s actor mm-hmm. um, who needs no introduction in my mind but you know Batman yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're the, the opening so we introduce all these characters very quickly we don't really get a sense of who they are we just get a sense of criminals and a cop and then we get this uh, robbery sequence at the beginning so pretty iconic robbery sequence fish yeah uh, where they knock over a van so can you just talk you through can you talk through your emotions from watching this uh, opening robbery scene well can, can I, for me and because obviously i'd never seen this before it really reminded me of the opening to the dark night yes um, yeah i was sort of took by how similar it was and i, I, I i'm taking a huge guess that christopher nolan might have sort of nicked some elements of this maybe because it was so similar I think almost almost certainly even down to the point of casting William Fickner that was exactly what I was going to say because I I was like oh this is a bit like the dark knight and then in the next (laughs) scene is it Fitchner Fitchner Fickner Fickner. Fickner. so he turns up I was like oh my god yeah because he has the shotgun in the dark knight and he's running through the bank trying to blow them away and I was like this is it's a homage it's got to be a homage to heat hasn't it the the beginning of the dark knight Uh, well, so. that, absolutely, the, the structure of heats that where we you follow the Joker and you follow Batman and the kind of vibe of it, and even the the score is incredibly similar. So the yeah. the, the, the the music of Heat is this uh, thing where it has a couple of notes that just repeat, or one note that it hangs on to to build tension. Yeah. And that's exactly what you do that happens in the with the Joker in the Dark Knight. Yeah, so Christopher Nolan, a massive fan of this movie. Um, he's actually was heavily involved in the thirty five year anniversary of this movie i think he hosted the q a really with uh, michael mann and the actors so i think he'll he's shamelessly admitted to mm-hmm. you know r- ripping it off um i mean it's not i mean it's a rip off in kind of style and tone and structure but it's not like beat for beat uh a remake yeah, i mean a movie that is a beat yeah it was just not like knocking over the you know a big van gets knocked over and then they escape in an ambulance or they steal an ambulance a bit like the joker does and and yeah. I guess it's just yeah. It was just very similar. I mean, one thing that this robbery sequence does very well in comp- that maybe the Dark Knight doesn't is just this. Um, even though you, you, well, first of all, you get a sense that these are guys doing a job really well professionally by the beat. You know, you know, like beat for beat, they know what they're doing. The start of the Dark Knight doesn't really feel like that. It still feels like it's a bunch of criminals kind of together robbing a bank. They don't feel particularly well organized, and this feels like very much like while well, these guys are on it, boom, boom, boom. And there's a real tension to it as well that they have to get out of here quickly. And there's a, you know, and it's it's kind of these loud noises punctuated with silence as well at the start. You get the big boom explosion and it all goes quiet. I don't even know I've seen this movie like 10 or 12 times. Like my heart was kind of still pumping a little bit at that beginning. It still gets going. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it feels very tense. That's, yeah. that's important with the, the, the silence. It's kind of in, in all the big uh, sort of action sequences in this film, there is there's very little music, you know. It's almost mm-hmm. like that... Uh, Jurassic Park T-Rex scene, you know, no music and it kind of makes it a lot more visceral, kind of really amps up the tension yeah. quite a lot, doesn't it? And when you do hear music, it almost it almost feels like like a ticking clock. That's what it sounds like. Like it's yeah. like um 
yeah, it's well, that's it another just Nolanism as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. It is. It is a, a Nolanism that's been taken. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this this rob this although it's a, very, a professional job when they do they they're, they're robbing uh they're robbing bearer bonds which are these kind of big giant ways of saying this this piece of paper's worth fifty thousand know, pounds. I, I I'm 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 you know. Forty years old, and I still don't know what they are. I have no <laughs> idea. You hear about them in movies all Vera the time. Bonds. Yeah, they're basically like yeah, pieces of paper that are worth five hundred or a million pounds, like lots of money, but on a piece of paper that is like a, a, yeah. a, a sophisticated, like it's signed off by the bank, and it says this. Yeah, this is worth this, and it's that. It's just a, a, a better way of trying transferring cash. I guess it's kind of sure. like owning owning like an actual stock certificate, isn't it? It's like yeah, yeah. You Was know. it like an NFT? <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're robbing bitcoins if this was done today it'd be like oh, um, yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> so the robbery happens it kind of goes wrong because Wayne Grove the new recruit um, just shoots somebody yeah I mean oh, uh, just talking about character introductions as well boy did they set him up to be the villain of this movie you know all these other guys are <laughs> well dressed nice haircuts and then this guy comes on screen with his balding head and beard and tattoos and it's like okay yeah we, we get it this guy's yeah I, I knew it was bad the minute he asked for a refill on his coffee and then just exactly. walked away from the counter i was like yeah. oh the bit the bit for me is where um i, f- I forget the, the the guy who's a dick in every size more tom size he's, he, he's trying yeah. to chat to him and he tells him to mm-hmm. stop talking and then he just dead stop eyes talking him. slick which becomes slick, a, yeah, slick. Becomes a becomes big a part thing. of the movie. This slick, yeah, yeah. But line. he just stares at him dead, and you're like, oh god, he's he's bad news. <laughs> yeah, he's Stop talking, while you're slick. Um, mm. Okay, so robbery happens. Um, then we get um, a bit of drama at the house, as in um, we get a bit of drama with uh, Robert De Niro and Val Kilmer, in that Val Kilmer's also got a troubled marriage. Mm-hmm. His marriage is on the rocks of his wife. He's camping on Robert De Niro's floor. Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd, yeah. Yeah, didn't expect her to crop up either. No, another big 90s star. And then quite early in the movie, earlier than I remembered, was De Niro meets Edie, who's kind of De Niro's love interest in this film. Now, this is where... Go on. I was going to say, was that that early? It is. It's in the first section of the movie, yeah. I think think because the robbery and everything else probably takes 20 or 30 minutes and this is a three-hour film. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you break the movie down, this is all happening in in the first hour. Wow. Um, so this, as an adult now, I was the, the first scene. I was like, I view this completely differently now as a grown-up. That when this, this De Niro meets Edie, so I'm interested in what you make of this scene, Fish and Jim. I'll start with you, Fish, and mostly I'm interested in what you think of De Niro's motivations or what's going on in his head when he meets Edie and then he has a conversation with her. The way I just took it is that he's a complete loner who just wants to do his job and doesn't want any outside interference. But then he mm-hmm. realises he's extremely attracted to this person and then mm-hmm. begins a relationship with her. Uh, I think especially that happens later on when he's sat around the, the restaurant mm-hmm. and he's looking around to all his mates and they've yeah. all got mm-hmm. partners and then he decides to get up and give her a call later on. But obviously that's not in this scene. So I guess, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I guess in this scene it was just him establishing himself as a a loner and she yeah. broke through that shell i guess would that be fair to say well, i'll let jim go first before i tip him what i think yeah what i was going to say is that you know i mean <laughs> this guy's dating technique is terrible <laughs> um you know but i think it's, it's to play to the character you know he, he's sort of no nonsense gets straight to the point because basically whenever they're sharing a scene together and they're, they're, they're showing them sort of you know dating if you like it's just, it just seems like interrogation it's like mm. you know what do you do you like doing that got any brothers what do your family do it's just these like constant questions to her and i think it's just his way of very quickly trying to unpick somebody and get to the point very it's like quickly. talking to a toddler yeah it's constant yeah. questions do you like jam do you like jellyfish <laughs> what you like working there what area is that do you go to school for that what was that and how long you been in here you like it you live in this neighborhood but where's your family from originally so I guess I have a different interpretation to you two, um, and this is like where I said I view this very differently. So I think when I first watched the movie, um, I probably saw it the way Fish did, in the sense of um, this is someone who's... So he starts off very tough. He's like, well, why do you want to know what I do or what I say? Like, maybe he thinks he's a police informant. So yeah, that's not kind of where Fish is coming from. He's kind of very suspicious of this woman asking questions. And then when he realises that um, she's not, and that she's just interested in him, he opens up and he breaks and he gets to know her and he's 
oh, oh, maybe he's falling in love. And that, that's how I originally took the scene. But I don't take the scene that way at all now. So the way I interpret the scene is that Robert De Niro in this movie is a sociopath, right? He is a criminal. He doesn't actually feel emotions the way you or I feel emotions. He doesn't actually feel for anything. He, one of the big parts of the movie is where he says, don't get connected to anything you can't walk away from when you feel the heat around the corner, which is where the title of the movie comes from. So he is not actually interested in building a real connection with this woman. I think he goes in there, he, yeah, he, he's initially suspicious of her. When she reveals that she's interested in him, I think he goes on a very basic level, oh, I can get laid here, right? Just like I can get something out of this woman. You have a tight f***ing I can tell. So then he goes into, okay, I need to be in date mode. I need to show interest. I need to ask date questions. But I don't think he gives a shit about her at all whatsoever. I think it's just like, I have to, I have to so go So then why would, why would he bother... Why would he bother going through the whole palaver at the end where he goes to try and chase Well, we'll him? get to that later okay. about what, what, why, what, why, why I think that's there. But I think in this scene, just taking it as a scene, I don't think he's really interested in it. And I said, um, we're, uh, yeah, I think it's complete detachment, really. And, um, and that made me think that he's a real not, li not, not likable guy. Like, I think, you can go, I think you can watch this movie and kind of like Robert De Niro. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't this time through. I guess one thing we didn't... Um, talk about was this kind of they establish a little bit of a father son relationship with Val Kilmer, yeah, and Robert De Niro, where he kind of like is protective of him and looking after him when Val's obviously crashing on his couch because he's had some marriage trouble. Um, that I think is there. I don't think it's as strong as maybe as it could be, and uh, maybe we'll get onto that later. And I think if this movie had been cast slightly different, that you'd feel a bit more protective of Val. I think Val's too much of a grown up or an adult to truly feel like he needs to be babied by. Robert yeah. De Niro, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think what's also important that happens in this sort of first uh, part of the movie, the first half an hour, is you know with these uh, setting up of these uh, home life situations, you know, so Pacino has this sort of turbulent relationship with his uh, partner, and then uh, De Niro, you know, is a loner, and so so also has these similar issues with you know relationships and partnerships and stuff, and it it really kind of is setting up this idea that they are very similar men. They yeah, are basically yeah. the same person in you know, I agree. slightly yeah, different yeah, yeah. ways. You know, even to the point when after the heist, Robert De Niro comes home and he puts his gun down on the table and his keys, and it's kind of like a cop coming home after a shift. You mm -hmm. know? So yes. there's this like, direct parallel being set up very early on. Yeah, and I think there's a mistake that can be made about this movie in that people go, oh, they're two sides of the same coin or they're opposites of each other and like you know i think when the, when you have a movie like that where you've got a criminal and a bad guy it's like oh they're opposites they're not act, they're not opposites at all they're not like they, they're actually very similar people um in that they're both obsessed with their work they both struggle with their home life and they're both very dedicated and good at what they do i think that the, the the key difference between them is this empathy thing which are and which is i'm sort of hinting at when with de niro meeting um Edie, and then when Pacino actually, when he goes to the crime scene, which I think uh, happens in this early start too, or it's just on the edge. Yeah. So I'll talk about it now where he goes and there's a, a prostitute that's been killed. He doesn't know. We know as the audience that she was killed by Wayne Grow. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a lot of empathy for the mother and he hugs her and he holds her. And I, and I think that is the key difference between De Niro and Pacino is that he's yeah. actually very yeah. emotional and invested. Okay, so again, the, the only other thing that kind of happens at the beginning of this movie is we establish Van Zandt as a character. So this is the man whose bearer bonds have been robbed, um, yeah, again, played by William Finkner. Fink Finkner? <laughs> and um, here we establish that De Niro is going to try and sell his own bonds back to him because he's going to get the uh, insurance money from getting robbed. But they think, well, let's make some, a quick buck and actually sell them back to him and um, make some money there. So that kind of storyline is established too before we move into the middle part of the movie now the middle part of the movie which is when you when you get when you break this down into three hours because a three hour movie the the, the the middle section is actually the bit i remember the least and it's probably because the least happens but this is kind of the diamond heist section where de niro and his crew find out that they are being watched um and you get the van zan trying to get his money back scene you get more trouble at home with vince um, so I guess we could just talk about this opening section. So this this section for you, Fish, you get... Did you... Were you following along with the the kind of the plot about this whole selling the bonds back to Van Zandt and then that kind of him them trying to trick De Niro and, you know, they get the bag of fake money, which is pieces of paper, this kind of scene here. Did you... Were you 
Yeah, yeah, I, I got all that. I, I wasn't quite clear on who uh, the character was. I've just called him the right. guy from Mission Impossible. Um, the long-haired guy. Oh, um, sort of... John Voight. Oh, John yes. Voight. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. He, he yeah. Was... John... So, do you know that he's Angelina Jolie's dad, by the way, Fish? Who is? John Voight. Mission, Mission Impossible guy. Mission Impossible man. That's, That's Angelina, Angelina Jolie's, dad. Jolie's dad. Yeah. 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 Good grief, she got away with looking like that, didn't she? Well, she looks identical <laughs> to her mum, by the way. So if you see her mum, spitting image. Yeah, I wasn't exactly clear <laughs> where he'd come into play or what his deal yeah. was, what he was getting out of it. I'm a little bit lost on his character. Everything else, I, you know, was perfectly clear. It was just his um, part in the whole affair. It was like he seemed untouchable. He seemed to be... Um, yeah, yeah. A bit out of a get out of jail free card, almost but literally. It was like you just go yes. to him and he solves all your problems. Yeah, basically. he's kind of like the 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 super criminal, isn't he? The sort of you know he organizes all the right. jobs and. Yeah, he's kind yeah. of like uh, in Reservoir Dogs. He's like um, Eddie Bunker, isn't he? He's like the, he's like the guy the guy that's a bit too old <laughs> yeah. to be doing these criminal jobs himself now. So he hires the young crew organizes them gets all the information yeah. and maybe takes 10 percent at the end because he doesn't really do any work but he set it all up and takes uh takes a percentage so i think you're right he is kind of untouchable because he's just sat in a chair in a house somewhere and probably has yeah. five people making a phone call for him i guess the bit that's a bit weird is that he does have a lot of direct one-to-one face time with robert de niro but i think that's for the for the movie's benefit probably in real life you wouldn't uh it's like poorly in goodfellas isn't it it's like he's the head of the ah sure the organization yeah he doesn't get dirty, his hands dirty with the groundwork you, okay you kind of need that character don't you just to kind of push the movie along and and you know drop information and yeah and i kind of see where fish is coming from where it feels a little bit weak in the sense that that's the character's main role really but it's never kind of explained you know it's just oh we need a bit more information we need we need some something dropped in the story mm-hmm. here so we'll get this guy to yeah. do it and the other thing was and this was probably Mission Impossible's fault. <laughs> I was absolutely convinced that he was going to be a baddie. Oh, turn on De Niro. I yeah. think you kind of expect him to a little bit. To, I think there is a point in the movie where you think maybe he's going to like get, drop some information on De Niro and just walk away with all the cash himself. I think that is something you maybe think is going to happen. I thought you were going to say he was going to take a mask off because he does look like he's in disguise the whole way through this movie. <laughs> that, would, <laughs> yeah. that would be incredible. Yeah, yeah. He just whips his skin off and it's somebody It's else. Al Pacino. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I mean, one observation I did have just on a, like a filmmaking level around about this time in the movie was like, um, I think because we're in this era of COVID films, maybe we've had two or three years of COVID films and we've had direct to, direct to streaming films in that this isn't, I don't think was a very expensive movie at the time. So the budget in 1995 was like 60 million pound, which feels kind of quite high, but not like mega budget. Yeah. I, I assume it was probably quite high. But like just how big this movie is in terms of scope like every scene has like what feels like a hundred extras in it mm. and it's all happening in the real world mm. so like you get the bank robbery scene it's outside they're driving a car onto a freeway and there's cars everywhere then um when Edie and De Niro meet in the restaurant and have a meal it's a big restaurant there's like 100 people around them all having meals and talking and um and then they have a big family dinner like all the criminals get together and meal again another big restaurant lots of people when De Niro walks into the police station just lots and lots of extras everywhere Mm-hmm. And that really struck me watching the movie. Now I don't know if it if it made an impact on you guys that like this movie takes place in the real world and just feels like lived in. It doesn't feel like I'm watching a movie on a soundstage or we've had to blue screen this or it's in like you know Star Wars eco chamber of a set. You know and oh, absolutely. Yeah, and the, one the one, of the one bit, thing that sorry I was going to say the one thing that I yeah. noticed really was there was lots of big sweeping shots of LA mm-hmm. or or helicopter yeah. shots, lots of aerial stuff. Just that that made it feel big yeah. and real to me there, there's there's, there's yeah. one shot where uh de niro and john voight are talking face to face and in the background is a freeway and it just sort of disappears mm-hmm. into the distance and it's just like you know that's that's great direction because that shot could have been anywhere it could have just been in in a house or in the the parking lot or whatever but just to go to that effort of like you know framing la in the way that they do in this movie just you know it's kind of like a love letter to la isn't it in the sense that it's just this huge, expansive city. Um, and yeah, I, I think I did read that this was completely shot on location. There was not a single soundstage. Yeah, 100% used, locations. Which yeah. really shows. We're in, we were in the real location. Yeah. With it, you know, up above uh, Sunset Plaza. And you're looking out at the night. But you couldn't photograph it on film. You could in yeah. high def, which is why I did what I did in, in, in um, you know, Collateral. Mm. So to to be able to see into the night the way you could, what we did is we put green screens up, 
blocking the actual view, shot the scene, and then took the green screens down and then shot the background, but at three frames per second, so we could get exposure. Right. And cool. so that's so is uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Very cool. Michael Mann uses a lot of real people as well to fill roles. So like in that scene where De Niro, um, Zanucci Pacino comes to for that robbery and all the policemen there and the crime scene investigators, apparently they're all real, mm-hmm. you know, guys. Um, so, it, you know, if you can do that, I mean, amazing. Yeah, that's definitely the way to go. Mm. Um, it just feels very different. Like one thing I thought of is like the opening of like Hot Fuzz. Do you know when like uh, Simon <laughs> Pegg goes to meet his wife in the, and it's like a crime scene. It's very obviously a set of a body and a bunch of extras yeah. just been told to stand in the corner and like look at things and point at pieces of paper just feel the vibe is completely different i mean i understand one's a one's a comedy but you're, you're can... suggesting the vibe between hot fuzz and heat different <laughs> but you just i think you know when you're watching a movie i think on like a kind of um there's like a i think our audience members know it as well but maybe they because then the, you know when you're watching something that is fake and constructed and on a set and when you're watching this outside and real <sighs> i just think i've got to apologize to jim because here it goes the uh, the Obi Wan series on uh, <laughs> Disney Plus suffers from this exact problem. Should point out that Jim yeah. doesn't like talking about Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the Obi Wan series. If you compare it to something like Stranger Things, which were released at uh, series four, which were released at roughly the same time, it's, it's yeah. night and day. You can tell that Obi Wan was filmed in this the volume. That's what it's called. That Stranger, yeah, Stranger Things was you know a lot of sets Stra- and yeah. And, Stranger Things has, it kind of walks a fine line between actual real life locations outdoors and stuff they have to build because it's like a it's a period thing, right? But one of the going back, not to talk about Obi Wan too much. Apologies again to Jim. <laughs> one of the things I really hated about that show is that like you have a big cantina scene, but then like a Sif walks in, everybody stops. And like, not, they don't even show that the extras are having real conversations. They're just all there. Bad guy yes. walks in, everybody stops and looks at the bad guy. The whole scene becomes focused on that because that's just not real life. No. It's like everything everything revolves around, it's like it doesn't feel like a real lived in, which is ironic because that was the big thing about the original Star Wars was how lived in and, you know, when 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 Obi-Wan and Han Solo are having a conversation or someone gets his arm chopped off in the bar, everyone goes back to doing what they're doing, don't they? Once that guy gets his arm chopped off and Obi- right. will, everyone does yeah, a lightsaber. Yeah. It's like it's no big deal. Yep. But anyway. Um, <laughs> right. So section two of the movie, sorry. this I mean, the big stand... We get the cafe scene, first of all, now. So I guess we should talk about this cafe scene. And this 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 is the, the big performance moment and i guess one thing i didn't realize until i broke down this movie into the three parts is that this this cafe scene with de niro and pacino happens actually right bang in the middle of the movie i think it's exactly halfway right nice um so uh fish did you did you know this scene was coming ahead about this is like uh, one of the most famous scenes in cinema i think or like you know it was a big it was talked about these two big actors are going to sit down have a scene together and it was like who's going to win the scene it's like a performance duel you know, it's it's like it's like Obi Wan versus Anakin Skywalker, but with acting. <laughs> who's gonna Who's gonna win the acting duel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you asked me, did I know it was coming? No, no idea. <laughs> Knew nothing about it. Um, but yeah, but, but probably the best part of the film for me just was listening to these two just talk, and obviously mm. have such mm-hmm. admiration, bizarre admiration for each other. And respect yeah. for each other's craft. Yeah, um, it was a really amazing scene. And, and, and the, the, the last shot, in fact, I think was Pacino, and you just see a flicker of a smile mm. just just drift over his face, and it's it's um it's pretty incredible, really. I think Al Pacino is really really good in this scene. Yeah, De Niro, I, I think, is actually less good, but I mean, I think De Niro did his De Niro face a couple of times, which I enjoyed. Yeah, the one the one that's mimicked by everybody. I think Absolutely. Paul Rudd does a really good De Niro face. Actually, I think De Niro is actually better when he's not speaking. Actually, he's yeah. he's better when he is speaking. I think he's doing that De Niro thing where he, he's like, "Oh, now we have we have met, and if I see you come around the corner, you know, I won't hesitate. I will kill." Okay. I'm not. It does. It I, it's not the same. Mm. But then he's like this emotionless killer. I guess is what we're saying. And De Niro mm. again is this passionate mm. guy mm. that feels things. So maybe maybe it all works. My uh, um, my main takeaway from this scene actually was um, just going back to when Natalie Portman shows up. Yes, and there's, there's a whole bit of business about um, 
she's waiting for her dad to pick her up and her dad doesn't pick her up and mm. uh, Pacino's pissed about all that. And yeah, I, yeah. It's one of the first notes that I made and it's uh, Natalie Portman's dad is definitely De Niro. Right. <laughs> now, <laughs> is, I is think when I you watch down. it... Yeah, go on. Yeah. And I was 100%, 100% convinced right up until this scene and I'm not sure exactly what it was but I, I just realised that that my imaginary plot device in my head just wasn't going to play out. From I think it was something that no, De Niro said. About I'm glad you've said that, family. Fish, because I had the exact same feeling the first time I watched this movie, and I ah, even had, yeah. I even had like between watching it the first time and second time, I had that like Mandela effect where I was convinced oh, that was the case. Like so, when I watched it the second time, <laughs> and I think I maybe had a conversation with you, Dave, and our good friend uh, Pete. Uh, about this very thing we we talked about this and you guys were like no who would have thought that that's ridiculous um right. so yeah i'm glad that somebody else had the same no okay I, I mean i take it back now i think if you're a first time audience member you are expecting these stories stories to connect in some way so i think it's perfectly fine to think that yeah it's there's going to be some sort of reveal about i, I was Portland's waiting dad. for this for the scene where de niro comes to pick up his daughter and then they sort of mm -hmm. they, they realize that they've seen each other through binoculars or something and yeah. you know they have a <gasps> yeah Moments. Yeah, I mean, but, famously, yeah. this this that 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 is used to great effect in Spider Man Homecoming. <laughs> if you choose to do that, <laughs> where they do do Hang a wrap around bit? where there is a, well, there is a reveal oh, that someone's oh, dad Keaton. is someone's dad. <laughs> that's right, yeah. with Michael Keaton. That is excellent. Yes, I think that's exactly yeah. what I was waiting for. That exact. Well, that's scene. what we're all conditioned to think, actually. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. Sick reference, though, bro. Oh, thanks, bro. Dude, your references are out of control. Everyone knows that. The one that I sing. Just to say about the scene as well, is one of the things that makes it good from kind of, a, well, a filmmaking point of view, and you're talking about how great these actors are, is that it was completely unrehearsed as well. So That's true. they'd learned the yeah. script, but they hadn't rehearsed it at all because they wanted there to be this sort of uh, unknown chemistry between them. Uh, so yeah, they, kind they of set up two, yeah. two cameras and shot them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, individually rather than just sort of doing the one setup at a time. So. I think when you think about it like that and think about, you know, I mean, they probably yeah. shot for like an entire day and did the conversation many times, but it just thinking about it like that is quite unbelievable as well. Yeah, there's lots of, there's different schools of thought on filmmaking, I guess, is that some people think you rehearse the scene, you know, in the background around a table with some coffee and some star, Starbucks and the script in front of you and you do it 10, 10 times and you get the scene perfect and then you go and film it. And then there are other people that like, yeah, like they did with this movie where you just turn up on the day prepared and you kind of learn the scene on camera. Mm. And so and I, I, as personally as someone, you know, if I, if I thought, well, how would I want to do a scene if I ever did direct a scene? I think that is the way to go. I mean, it costs more money. I guess that's the thing in the old days because film's mm -hmm. expensive. These days, who cares? You've got digital cameras. Yeah, ideally, you don't want to have something amazing happen in a rehearsal and then go, oh, shit, we didn't have the cameras there. Let's try and recreate that. So absolutely the best. Definitely do it in front of the cameras. Right. And then I guess the middle section of the movie, the last sort of section of this movie is the big bank robbery scene. Mm -hmm. um, and now this is a scene, Fish. I probably talked about it with you guys, not on this podcast before, but like when I was a teenager, I was very fortunate to have a 5.1 surround sound setup, which was a rare thing when I was growing up, even though I, I lived in a fairly modest small bungalow with my dad <laughs> we had a, a big tv and a 5.1 surround sound sound system and nothing else and, and nothing else yeah it was like that basically you know like like true poor cinema for cinema files um and so when when the friends would come over i would rock a few different scenes uh just to show off the sound system of the tv it was the matrix uh lobby shootout sequence the opening of saving private ryan and uh, this heat bank robbery sequence mm -hmm. was on the show, Real Fish. And this, I still have a 5.1 sound system. Knocked it up to 11, as they do in this Aspire tap, and uh, watched this sequence. And, and boy, is it still blow you away every time. So, yeah, Fish, come on. Probably less impactful on uh, a pair of AirPods, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, maybe. Um... <laughs> and an iPhone. When you watch this on the toilet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With one <laughs> AirPod in, one ear. <laughs> You're desperately trying to Yeah. Um Yeah. I did enjoy it. Yeah. I'll be ruthlessly honest, I thought it went on too long. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, get on with it. Oh. Come on, we get it. Shooty shooty, bang bang. <laughs> you know oh, what dear. I mean? Skip skip to the end. Oh no. <laughs> wow. Know? Wow. That was just 
what, that was what I was feeling when I was. We watching. need a new type of siren, actually. And like, well, not the woke police. It's just like a siren that comes in and saves us from ourselves. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I thought. That was my honest opinion. I was like, okay, you were just I, get like, I get it. But you know, I've seen a million shootouts in films, and it was very. Have well Have you done. seen a million shootouts? Like, oh, it's very well done. Okay, okay. <laughs> of course, it was well done. I, like, it, wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't shit. It was just too long. I get on with it. Oh, well, I don't. I don't know what to say. Well, I think that the, the, the more it goes on, the more like I'm. I was like, I felt like I, I didn't breathe for the yeah. entire of the sequence watching it this time. Again, I just felt like I was on the edge of my seat again. It, it's kind of emotional. I, I almost got a little bit tearful. But I guess because I'm watching it on this big Grow sound up. sound, I think this. I think, yeah, no, but I think they make this is. I think this is what a big a cinema, you know, and a sound system makes the difference. Is I'm there and like these gunshots again. I feel like I'm getting hit in the chest, and, I, and I, you know, it feels like I'm, yeah, like I've done a bit of a marathon or something. And it just felt like I, I just like I was dazed and emotionally, just, literally mm-hmm. breathless. I, I felt watching it, and I felt Why that way again now. Were the police shooting shotguns at long range targets? They just had what they had, Fish. They just had what they had on them, you know? They didn't come prepared for this. It's just annoying. That's what's the... <laughs> it's like, come on. Get your pistol out. You're doing a shotgun for you. You're going to hit anyone. They probably fired their pistols, ran out of bullets, and switched to the shotgun, given how long it's gone. they got like a whole bag of ammo they're carrying, De Niro and you know, everybody else. Sure. Well, I, I, you know... Well, that was, that was another one. That. It's like, how much ammo have you got? Like, Val Kilmer's just... Lots. Spraying bullets. You never yeah. run out. I think it's a Crazy. realistic amount. I think... <laughs> this scene is just amazing I mean first of all they recorded all the gunshot sounds live on set so there's been no mm, doubling absolutely. of those gunshots which is why they're just so like impactful right and the other thing is the way Val Kilmer like reloads his rifle apparently is like professional level like and, and but you can watch it yeah you know when you see it and they even apparently they show this scene to like marines during training to show how you should correctly retreat from gunfire um, which is hilarious in its own right because it Fork sounds car. honestly they, they do this but I just right, imagine lads, I imagine watch like a, Val Kilmer he knows what to <laughs> exactly. do exactly I imagine like a room full of marines right and it's like that time at school where you're like in English class and they put a film on right I can just imagine all these marines yeah. getting excited so oh, we we get to watch Heat today guys yeah. <laughs> well they wheel yeah. the telly in. Yeah. I have two guns one for each of you after this scene, um, we, we after find this out scene, that uh, we get Jeremy Piven. That's what we get after Jeremy this scene. Piven before the before before the hair surgery <laughs> pre 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 hair surgery. Jeremy Piven when he's still bald, he's the uh, doctor that gives his way his shirt. To De Niro. And you are recognised him. Yeah, famous as the principal from old school. Oh, yes. <laughs> Is that what he's famous for? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, that um, is on his IMDb page. I think. <laughs> Uh, known for okay so we we basically this bank this bank robbery went wrong okay it wasn't supposed to be a giant shootout in the streets right now this is something that i didn't quite even this time watching it i didn't put the pieces together i was like why did that bank scene go wrong how were they tipped off i don't remember um, oh, and it turns out the reason oh, they were tipped off you've got yeah, it go yeah go on go no, carry on carry i got on. it i got it in the end yeah is that um wayne grow goes to van zan and and goes i could help you out and he basically r- gives up um trio uh, danny trejo the uh the mexican chap who was part of this crew from the original robbery at the end he goes this is where this guy lives so they go around there they now this is this is actually something that came to me as an adult that we'll touch on that this scene was a lot more darker than i originally thought so basically they torture danny trejo and he gives up that they're going to do this bank robbery and so they they the Van Zan, the guy who got robbed at the beginning, he's the guy that tips off the police, basically, mm-hmm. um, and sets it all up because he wants Robert De Niro to get killed as an act of revenge. Now, did you understand all that fish? Because I, I tell you, I didn't until this watching it. It was like the fourth or fifth uh, time I watched this movie. I, I didn't at first, and then at the end, when uh, you see De Niro talking to Machete. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I did understand at that point. Yeah, I was a little bit confused as to how it was. Uh, I I think this is like yeah. what I was saying at the the start of the podcast. There was how like sort of unmemorable this film has been to me because it is. It's, I mean, it's not that complicated. It's not hugely confusing, but you do have to pay attention. And you know, if somebody asked me to recite blow by blow that, like what happens in this, oh, I couldn't movie, have told him that. You can't yeah, do no. it, can you? It's quite difficult to remember. I can now. 
But yeah, if you if you'd asked me like, yeah, how did they how did they get tipped off to the bank robbery? Completely forgotten yeah. how that whole happened. Now the reason this thing is a lot darker to me now than I watched it previously is that um, they established that Wayne Grow is a rapist and a killer. Yes. Right. And so he's the guy that went around Danny Trejo's house, and so he actually must have raped and murdered Danny Trejo's wife, which I didn't really pick up on before when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So when De Niro goes around there and he, he's like, don't leave me like this, kill me. It's, his wife's already been raped and murdered, which was like, whoa, that's way darker than I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is also the scene where Edie finds out, okay, about Robert De Niro. Now, we, I guess we can we can talk about what Fish was saying earlier about why, does Robert De Niro care about Edie here and what's this whole arc mm-hmm. with the story. So um, first of all, I think I'd love to know Edie's backstory and why she thinks that she can't do better than Robert De Niro. I guess that is a part of Do you get the vibe, guys? I got the vibe that she must have been, like, abused or in some had a really tough life Well, I think there to is, be putting all her eggs in this basket. Yeah, I don't think you need to know anymore, but there is a line, isn't there, early in the film where, she, you know, he, he asks her to go away with her and says, you, you don't know me, you don't, you know. And there's, so there is obviously something that's come before that, but I don't think it's important to know too much about that. No, but she's not... She doesn't come across as a as a bright, confident woman, does she, Edie? Like, you know, I feel like she's Mm-mm-mm. like damaged in some way. You know, that's why they're drawn to each other, isn't it? Because they're both damaged people. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, lonely. Yeah. Okay. So then, so I think that Robert didn't. So this is like, does Robert didn't care about Edie? Which is the question like Fish kind of posed, and like, does she crack through? So there, there's there's a scene in the middle of the movie where they, he has a, a lunch with all his bank robbery friends and he sees that they've got wives, they've got kids and Robert De Niro has decided that this is his last job and he's going to retire mm. and like go to New Zealand and just not be a criminal anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think Edie is just a function. She's just convenient. She's just the woman that came along right now. And he's like, well, I'm going to retire away from crime. I guess I should get married. I guess I should settle down. Well, Edie, do you want to come with me? I never bought their relationship. Um, no. Right up until the end, I never thought they, they were madly in love. And I thought that was... Well, I think she loves him. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. I, I, it just didn't sit with me. But I think now that saying what you're saying about him being a um, a bit of a sociopath and just she's just a, almost like a trophy, if you like. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that kind of makes more sense and that, that ties into yeah. that and I think that's yeah. that's. I mean we're getting into the last act of this movie now so I, I think that is why he walks away from her at the end as well he walks away from her because he can he could not walk away from her he could get arrested do his time in prison I don't know how long he'd get 10 years and like, well, or he could just decide he wants to be with her or take try, you know he, he walks away from her and I think that's the key there's the key moment in the film isn't there at the end where he Mm-hmm. has the decision to make because he can he can get on this plane he can get away with ed he can fly away he can but he decides to take the off ramp and uh get his revenge and go after wayne grow what do you think would be a better film ending if he hadn't chosen to go and get revenge and had flown i did off think i did want to put it to you and jim i did want to put like if let's say the movie ends with like because i feel like this is the more christopher nolan ending isn't it where yeah, you get yeah. to the end of the movie and like you know that he can he's go in, left. He's in a cafe and he winks at Alfred. <laughs> no, but you know he can go left to get on the plane and go away and leave a happy life with Edie, or he can go right and get his revenge on Edie, and then like the movie just cuts before he makes a decision. Yeah. Like which road to take. That's like the oh, okay. the, 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 the uh, yeah. Nolan ending where it's just up to you, the audience, to decide which 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 did he take. Yeah. And I wonder if that oh, okay. is a better ending. You know, if we didn't know. A yeah, shorter uh, ending. Sure, so it would have cut a good half an hour yeah. off the end of the film. <laughs> there's, there's the other ending where, you know, he decides to stay and he gets arrested. He goes to prison. Then, you know, 15 years later, she's waiting outside the prison for him. Then he goes oh, and terrible. sits and watches a ball game with Pacino. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, is, um, this, this, this is, again, the parallel. And this is, this is something, again, I didn't pick up when I was a youngster. There is a parallel in the last 30 minutes of this movie um, after the bank robbery, De Niro has got his money. He can get away, um, but decides to go and get revenge on it because someone gives him a tip about where Wayne Grow is and he decides to get revenge. That scene is actually a direct parallel to uh, Al Pacino finding Natalie Portman has tried to commit suicide yes, and then taking her to the hospital. Again, I didn't pick up on this at all when I was younger. And then his wife asks Pacino, is there any chance you and me can work out? And Al Pacino could in that moment choose to go, yeah, there is a chance you and I are going to work out and turn his beeper off. Yeah. 
and actually stay in the hospital. But he goes, nah, you know, really, I'm not what you want. And um, mm-hmm. leaves to go after De Niro. Yeah. And like that didn't, he didn't have to do that. Yeah. And that completely washed over me when I was younger. I didn't really understand humans and emotions. Yeah. No, it was, um, there's a nice little thing I noticed as well, whether it's intentional or not, when uh, De Niro and Edie are in the car uh, driving towards the airport. He says something, oh, we're home free now. And then instantly they drive into a tunnel that is very heavily lit and it is like a white tunnel. I don't know if that's like death foreshadowing or not. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know yes, if, yes, if I remember the scene talking about it. that smart or not, or if it was unintentional. But to me, that was quite an obvious, like, oh, shit, this guy's going to die now because he's going through this white tunnel to death. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's like a moment of bliss, I think, as well, as the way it's, cause it's described. Because you get that white tunnel before he then decides to pick the off ramp, yes. isn't it? I think it's quite hinting that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. this could have been his mm. happy, mm. blissful life. Uh, did you feel tense, Fish, going, please don't go off the off ramp, please don't take that off ramp? I kind of got that vibe in my head. I was like... Oh, I wanted him to go and kill the guy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 100%. Yeah, yeah, no, I wanted him to go to the hotel and finish him off. Oh, absolutely. I didn't. Did not. Right, no. But surely you know that's going to go badly for him if he does that. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was was tense not knowing, because I avoided spoilers completely for this film. I had no idea who lived, who died, what happened. So it Mm. was pretty tense at the end watching them run through the airport um but yeah well um, we can talk we can jump right to the end i mean you, de niro goes to the airport kills wayne grow um comes out of the airport I, did, I just quick, i did enjoy his death as well as, as dark wayne as grow's is, death when he just shoots him in the chest and you just hear him like, makes like, him look <laughs> him in the eyes first yeah makes him look him in the, oh, i enjoyed that because he was such a cock like that <laughs> <laughs> um i like the moment where because there might have been some doubt in Edie's mind, like I like that moment where she's in the car and like all this police and firemen are turning up, and she kind of must know that wow, the guy I'm with has caused all of this. This is all yeah. his doing. Like, um, and then he walks out, and then he looks at her and he runs away, and then the last image that Edie must have is Al Pacino chasing after Robert <laughs> De Niro with a gun. He like looks that's at him, right. and that, that's yeah, the, yeah. that is the last she's ever seeing of Robert De Niro. Is him being chased by a cop? I just thought, wow. Yeah, that's amazing. It annoyed Dramatic. me throughout this whole scene while she's sitting in that car that, you know, with everything that's just going on, you know, police, fire engines, nobody asked her to move the car. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like the fact that he parked there in the first place and some security guard didn't come along and say, hey, dude, you can't fucking park here. And like, then nobody says anything to her. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of security problems in this film. The fact that they <laughs> climb over a fence and end up on a runway. I mean, wow. come on. You know, yeah, that airport would be shut down immediately. That's true. They probably would shut pre, the airport pre nine eleven though. Maybe it was true, uh, true, yeah. true, very Lacks. true, true. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So let's talk about this. The final scene of the movie then, which is the the showdown with Al Pacino and uh, Robert De Niro um, on a runway. Now, mm. did you were you rooting for either one of them, Fish? I really did not want Robert De Niro to die. Good question. Was I rooting for you? You'd, you know what? It was probably equal at the end. I wasn't yeah. particularly rooting for either one. I was completely up for. Obviously, one of them was going to die, right? That was pretty clear. Um, or he could have got him. away. I mean, yeah, I guess so. But I think <laughs> the amount of times he could have got away before then, it was pretty clear that this was the the final sort of showdown. Yeah, for one of them. Um, but yeah, I was wasn't rooting for either one. That's interesting. I was sort of if, if Pacino shot. Um, De Niro at the end, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd been up for that. Yeah. Vice versa, if he'd, if he'd got away with his little trick using the lights of the runway and, and shot Pacino. I then, think to... <laughs> but then how would he have then got away after that, I guess, would have been the thing. He's, you know, he's on his own without his money in yeah. the middle of an airport. I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. What were you thinking, Jim? Oh, no, all I was going to say was that I'm really glad that they avoided... Like, if this was a a less well-made movie or less well-written script, this 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 would have ended in a fist hand-on-hand combat, wouldn't it? Oh, true. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, they would have punch up. gone down to, you know. You know what it was? Go on. If it was a Michael Bay film, they'd have got on a plane. <laughs> yeah. And like you say, they'd be fist fighting yeah. on an off-ramp. There'd be a chase on the plane. runway, yeah. Pacino in yeah, his exactly, car like, yeah. chasing the, the jet, yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah. I think it's, you know, the whole point of this, well, 
a large point in this movie is that they're both two very similar men and you i don't think you're supposed to be rooting mm-hmm. for either one of them i think you're just waiting to see how the story unfolds and i don't think there's yeah. you know any need to kind of take sides i guess i just uh i really felt for Edie <laughs> in this watch of the the film and i just kind of wanted her to have her happy ending and i just felt such a such a tragedy that it, it's obvious that de niro doesn't really like her just like he's gonna die and like uh, mm-hmm. but the only guy that gets out of the movie alive actually is val val Kilmer. wow yeah in a, in a cool little cool little moment we haven't talked about where he turns up at the house i enjoyed that little moment actually yeah with his fresh new haircut well, yeah with his fresh cuts looking sharp yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a sequel to be made with Val's character. Yeah. What happened to him? Where did he go? Who knows? He uh, drives went away to fly uh, planes. He went into the RAF. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are still dangerous. You can be my wingman anytime. Bullshit. You can be mine. Okay, well, I mean, um, yeah, movie ends, uh, De Niro dies, and they hold hands as they're dying. In a, in a poignant scene, Fish, do you feel anything here? They're like, you know, holding Who hands. Who held hands? De Niro and Robert De Niro hold hands. De Niro, De Niro and Al Pacino. Yeah, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro hold hands as he bleeds oh, out I must on the runaway, bleeped. Fish. Yeah. Oh, okay, I missed that bit, to be honest. I thought they were just... Uh... Well, it's the big emotional punch at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very cool way to end the movie as well. The music comes in and they're on this framed on this runway. It just ends too. It ends when it's yeah. supposed to end. Yeah. It's like yeah. he's dead. Movie's over. Thank you. Roll credits. Okay. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and do categories, which is where we talk about uh, our favorite parts of the movie, break it down, some what ifs, hypotheticals. Um, so see you in a mo. This week's episode is sponsored by Dunkachino. You want creamy goodness? He's your friend. Say hello to his chocolate blend. Everyone wants a Dunkachino. Dunk, 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 Dunkachino. Burn this. Put your feet up. Get yourself a cup of tea. It's time for categories. Hello and welcome back. And uh, we're going to talk categories. So this is where we break down the movie into a number of different categories. I will explain them as we go. But the first up is our favourite line from the movie or memorable lines from the movie. Fish, memorable lines? I think we know one straight off the bat. There's only one for me, frankly. Yeah. And it's... He's um, he's chatting to Hank Azaria. Pacino's chatting to um, Hank Azaria. And they're talking about Ashley Judd. And he just goes off the fucking rails and goes... Because she got a great ass! And you got your head all the way up it! Now, what a line. And a out line. of the fucking blue, completely, what on earth is going on? So I guess Loved you're not it. one to read the internet movie trivia, Jim. I'm sure you know the, the internet bit of trivia that goes along with this that we have to tell Fish about. Please. Go, go for it. Or you want me to take it up? So the line was obviously unscripted, Fish. Oh, right. I could, you, you know what? He almost says big ass. <laughs> yeah. Because you can see his mouth yeah. go, great ass. And yeah. then uh, Hank Ansaria's reaction is obviously film for real. <laughs> and when he goes, Jesus, that was yeah, yeah, him, yeah. him replying <laughs> for real. Apparently he was actually terrified, as you would be if someone was doing that in front of you and you had to kind of keep it together and try and do a performance. When I see an ass, a woman's ass, something comes over me. <laughs> something, something comes out of me. I think something say. comes out of me. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Best line. But even, even the preamble up to that line as well, he's like, who, who, what, you're a fucking owl? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I, I quite enjoy the, uh, the whole shakedown interrogation scene. Um, which is a scene I, I used to be able to do start to finish. I wonder if I still could. Where Please don't. He's like, I do for you, you do for me. Huh? And he goes, brother, Vincent, man, my brother, he's, he's going he's gonna to meet you tonight. He, he, where is he? In Phoenix. Ah, Phoenix. When I go to Phoenix, <laughs> you're going to slip me a letter right under the door. <laughs> like this whole scene. <laughs> Give me what you got. Give me what you got. That whole scene is the other... Give me watching really that scene. Like, his, his, yeah. his, his police buddy, though, says the oldest oh, yeah. line. He just oh, says, he's great. Let's violate his ass. Let's violate his ass right now. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> there, was a, there was also one scene that I didn't remember that, came, that struck, stuck out to me this time is when Wayne goes with the prostitute 
and um, and then the prostitutes yeah. like you were the you were the fuck of the century. You're the rodeo man. You came in here and gave me the fuck of my life. I said, did they get Quentin Tarantino come in to write this one scene? <laughs> <laughs> I just felt like it was oh, yeah, felt yeah. really odd, really strange. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we've <laughs> talked about this. Uh, so this this next uh, next category is recast this, where you can recast any of the um, parts of the movie um, with other actors from the time period. So I'd like to go first, if I can, on this one. And this is where I feel watching the movie now, and I, I always kind of felt it. The Val Kilmer is not optimum casting in his role, and I say this is probably one of the biggest Val Kilmer fans that you could like to meet. I couldn't agree more. And apparently, an actor in original contention for this was Keanu Reeves, and I think boy would that have worked better. I wish you could read my notes. It just says here, one of my fourth note down. Kilmer is playing the Keanu part. Yeah, if it's Keanu Reeves, I just totally buy that Robert De Niro is more of a dad and more father figure and mean, more wants to look after. Do you mean Keanu from like that Kilmer's... era, as in like Bill and Ted? Keanu. Yeah, yeah, Keanu from yeah. that era. Val's just too strong, and even though he's playing a degenerate gambler, he just feels too much like a man who doesn't need protecting. Whereas Keanu is like a surfer dude, a little bit weak, a little bit out of it. I totally get Robert De Niro might want to look after him a little bit and take care of him. Maybe they should have. They should have given Val more lines because he probably only has less than a page of dialogue in this whole film. It's like he barely says anything. It's just he's he's Iceman. He's too... Like, you don't... <laughs> Val's not Ice someone... <laughs> he's not He's not someone that, like, you feel empathy for. Um, would you recast any other parts or anyone else you thought, oh, I'd love, love to have seen them do this? I, I don't know who would go in there, but I would recast uh, Edie. Um there's something about her that is, you know, I know she's so sort of supposed to be this sort of, I don't know, meek kind of reserved person, but I just feel like they could have cast someone with just a little bit more power. It's a different role it, then, but yeah, I get what you mean. I just don't like the character, really. I, I think that's the issue. I would like to, I, I either, either a little bit more about her to kind of explain, which is kind of what I was hinting at. Fish, any thoughts? Talia Shire. Talia Shire? Yeah. From you know, from Rocky, <laughs> from from the Godfather, Rocky. <laughs> yeah, I think have a more of a wafy, scared kind yeah. of performance. Yeah. Instead of, I think it's the same kind of character. To be honest, you're right. It is that character. Yeah. Which makes the fact that she approached De Niro such a big. Yeah. Uh, I get the impression maybe she'd been doing lots of self help classes. I get the impression that was like a big moment in her life. <laughs> I love that you about really that fleshed out her backstory. <laughs> She's yeah. damaged, she's been abused, and she's been doing self-help classes. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, she's been doing meditation. and you know. I get the, I, I just get, you know, when she asked De Niro about that book in that cafe, I bet that was the biggest moment of her, like, month, her year, to build up the confidence to do that. <laughs> sure. And when he shot her down, you know. Um, the next category is uh, food from the movie. Was there anything in this movie that looked appetising or you wanted to eat? Now, generally, there is in the movies. Is, do you think I've got to ask about this category? What is this category? <laughs> food from the Most movie. good movies have nice food in there. The most big classics. You know, we've got the Big Kahuna Burger. We've got the... Um... <laughs> yeah, name another. <laughs> Hang on. Name another. Just that one. <laughs> <laughs> Bubba Shrimp. Uh, <laughs> Bubba Gump Shrimp. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bubba Gump Shrimp. Um, that uh, mush- marshmallow and ice cream combo from Home Alone. Sure. Delicious. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, sad. I was glad to see Bubba Gump in this movie. Actually, by the way, <laughs> is Bubba Gump in this movie? I liked it. Yeah, Bubba oh, pops he? up. Yeah, he was riding high at this point in his career. Where's Bubba this, Gump? Is he? Know, is he? I'm going to violate Forrest your ass. Gump. Who is he? He's like one of the police guys, isn't he? The one that's with uh, Val Kilmer's missus. Oh, maybe you're right. He's in. Oh, is that him? I'm not sure if that's that's his character. Oh, He's in there. Mm, He's in okay, there. Okay. The next category is the Beckdale test, and this is known as the Beckdale Wallace test. It's a measure of the representation of women in fiction. It asks whether a work features at least two women who talk to each other about something other than a man. Well, there's only two women oh. in this film. This this movie is not best served and they by... Don't it doesn't best serve as female characters. No. They are extensions of the men, which is probably a weakness of the film. You've got three characters. You've got actually got quite, quite a few female characters. You've got Natalie Portman. You've got Pacino's wife, Val Kilmer's wife, Edie. I was j- just about to argue it might pass then if natalie portman's speaking to her mother but they're speaking about a man, aren't they? about, a man. Talking about her dad 
it's pretty poor in this regard in that all the women in this movie do exist as extensions of the men I mean, and they do not have lives of their own. Yeah. I mean, strictly speaking, I think it does because Natalie Portman and her mum talk about the fact that she's lost her uh, oh, hair. Oh, they do. <laughs> right, okay. So it does, technically it does pass. But, talk about what? Uh, she, she's she has lost... Like, I don't know. Yeah. Is it like a hair thing that she's asking for? Yeah, I don't hair no, she says shoes. She's after. It's a huge shoes. Well, or whatever it is. It's a word. It's a B word. It's like ber- berets. She's trying right? to be- yeah, berets. I think they're shoes. Oh, they're yeah. shoes. Oh, they? I thought it was shoes. How do you know so much about fucking shoes? <laughs> anyway. But she's only doing it because she doesn't want to be late to meet her dad. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is that this film definitely doesn't pass because <laughs> all, well, yeah, no. all of the decisions that these guys are making. Yeah are based on their relationships with their respective partners. Yeah. Or, or they have a huge influence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that is essentially, you know, it almost feels like the theme of the movie is that women are trying to destroy your life. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually better without yeah. them. <laughs> it's quite a male, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> It does, yeah, film. it's not a, yeah, it's not a flattering portrayal of women, uh, this, this no. film. I mean, the only one who's kind of got a little bit of retribution is uh, Val Kilmer's wife because she kind of, you know, ultimately saves him. So she, she needs, yes, yeah, she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, does another movie do this better? Now, this is interesting category, Fish. Is there a better crime movie than Heat? Well, I've only seen two. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, don't ask me. That's Jim. <laughs> uh, if we talk about heist movies. Uh, Reservoir Dogs. We're famously a heist movie about a heist. But yeah. Which came first? <laughs> uh, Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir yeah, Dogs. Okay. Yeah. Well, technically, Michael Mann had already made this movie. Um, he made a movie called L.A. Takedown in the uh, late 80s, yeah. which is a proto of Heat. So he kind of remade his own movie. It's the best heist movie ever made. Yeah, has to what? be. I think so. Guys on a job to rob a bank. Like, guys getting together to do a heist. I... I was going to say, res- I th- I'd prefer Reservoir Dogs to this. Do you not see Ocean's Eleven? <laughs> Ocean's Eleven, also good. <laughs> right, okay. So here's the thing. Oh, yeah. This film is too long. Agreed. I feel it's too long and there's just a bit too much fat on it. Some of these relationships could be gotten rid of and it wouldn't make any difference, right? Yeah. First of all, there's the the guy that becomes the new getaway driver, right? Yes. Before... I- before he gets recruited, there are at least two scenes of him yeah. where he gets a new job and he talks to his wife and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm, All of that mm-hmm. could go. They could Maybe. just recruit a new driver. You don't need to have that much emotional attachment to him when he gets killed. It doesn't matter. Get rid of that. I think you can also get rid of the fact that Wayne Grow is a rapist and a killer. I don't mm-hmm. think it's that important to the story. Yes, it does add some some stuff to it. But again, that shit can go too. Um I get if we're I mean, trying I, to make the I, leanest, like most audience friendly version of this film, you could cut this stuff. I, I agree. Yeah, let's chop it that's... out. I think you could uh, cut pretty much the entirety of Natalie Portman's. Oh, okay. I used that to think that. whole thing can go. And it, you I know, used still to think getting... that. Well, what changed? <laughs> well, in the scene that, that like, that. that you that, saw the Phantom that, Menace. That, uh, no, no. In that, <laughs> I used to think that. But, just, chick. but then now I realise that that exists to, to, to show. At why the owl's decision at the end to leave her is so bad, and that that's as in like he walks away from this family that clearly need him uh, to but, be but, a cop. But, but then, but but then, do you need any of that? Could it just be a cop against a, a you know a villain? Then it's like or... an action movie. Then you might as well go watch you know Face Off. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they, all these scenes contribute to make you care more about these characters and make this more than just an action yeah. film. Next category is memorabilia. Does it any memorabilia or what would you want from this movie? If you could take a piece of memorabilia from this film. I, would, I wouldn't mind just the police badge. And, and one thing I did think when I was watching this, that I'd really like Jim. Jim has a hobby where he makes action figures, makes little action figures, don't you, Jim? I do. Indeed. Using a... F- I would love a kind of uh, 3D... I don't want to divulge my production techniques. Thank sure. You, Dave. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. We can cut that out. Um, I Jim has a hobby where he <laughs> makes action figures. Uh, I would love a kind of 3D diorama, like statue, whatever you want to call it, of like De Niro laid bleeding out, holding hands with Pacino, his back turned, looking into the distance, <laughs> like as like a statue. I want that. That's pretty cool. I'd like. I'd like that. Or something simpler. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Um, if you're going to have a model of those two, I'd, it would be the from cafe. the diner scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the diner, yeah. Just sitting nah. opposite each other. <laughs> nah, nah. I like the manly holding hands. Fish, any, anything you'd want from this movie? Yeah, I want a diorama of Natalie Portman bleeding in the bath, please. Do, <laughs> oh, do that God. for me. Uh, police, help us out. Freeze! Woke police! I want to read that book about medals he's carrying around. <laughs> That's oh, a great yeah, piece, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. A book of medals. It's about metals, not medals. It's a oh, book it about metals. metals. Yeah. <laughs> book of Every medals. Time you've seen this film, you thought he was reading a book of medals. <laughs> I thought he was talking about medals. I thought he was like dealing in like antique medals. <laughs> the next job he's doing. So the next job he's doing, guys, he's gonna rob. He's gonna rob a museum of medals. He's working for the Olympics. <laughs> I've genuinely thought this whole time that's why he was going. <laughs> wow! Look at this Victoria Cross. <laughs> she actually says at one point like stress fractures or something. She looks at the piece of paper. in medals. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Famously. They're made of metal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. god. Wow. Christ. Amazing. I wonder I wonder what else I don't understand about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a book about medals would be yeah. what I'd want. <laughs> the the piece of metal. Metal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, from this film. Um right, weakest thing. What's the weakest part of this film, guys? The length. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Jim. Um like I said, I just think the excess fat on it, I think, yeah. The length, okay, we get it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Also, You're also, backing up Fisher's point about that gunfight going on too long, you realise? It did go on too long. Oh, dear. Something, uh, also, some of the music is a bit shit. It's right, very the, mo- the Moby scene. I, I had this thought when I was watching it. It's a real mixed bag of, of the time kind of mm. themes and... It goes back into the eighties a little bit. I mean, this is what ninety yeah. five. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's there one. Me, there's so. one scene, and I noted it down. It's like a synth drone pulse. Yeah, with yeah. Some electric guitar over the top. I was like, Jesus Christ, that's like that's a real sort of mid to late eighties kind of vibe, and it yeah. doesn't help with this film. I don't think because it really does date it more mm-hmm. than maybe maybe other films. As as fantastic as a filmmaker as Michael Mann is, Michael Mann, and he has done some other fantastic movies, Collateral, uh, Thief. Uh, he is known for questionable music choices. I would yeah. say. I just That's it's like his the one weakness. Is, the composer of this is Elliot Goldenthal. Yeah, like famous quick... from guys. Anyone want to well, take a punt? What else did he do? Well, I've got I've got it in front of me here, right? Let's let, let's list them. Well, I can tell you. The... I can tell you right now. Interview with the Vampire. Right. Yes. I guess. Yeah. 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 Uh, nominated for Academy Award Best Original Score, but yes, from the '90s, so '92 it starts. He does some others in the '80s, but it's Alien Three, big hitters. Alien yep. Three, Demolition Man, um, Golden Gate, Interview with a Vampire, something called Cobb. Mm-hmm. Don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, Batman Forever, Heat, mm-hmm. of course. Michael Collins, mm-hmm. uh, A Time to Kill, The Butcher Boy, Batman and Robin. Ooh, dear. When it Ooh, says here, back on a little. On a little note, score never commercially released. Yeah, no shit. Um, <laughs> then into 1998, we've got Sphere. Guys, you lost enough money on this one already. You probably don't <laughs> yeah, put the score yeah. out. <laughs> Just leave it. Yeah, Sphere in Dreams, Titus. Then it gets a bit... Then he goes to Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, if you remember that. Good movie, and then finally, good movie. he wins an Academy Award for Best Original Score in 2002 for a film called Frida. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't know he won the score, but yeah, that was yeah. Uh, so I mean, quite an interesting composer. He did some real, real big. He's a great composer. Flicks, yeah. So well, it, well, that was what we were saying was the weakest part of the film was the length and the music. I yeah. agree. I, I think the character of Edie. I think I touched on it a bit. I, I don't doesn't quite work for me. I don't like it. I don't. I don't know. The, I don't. Yeah, doesn't work for me. We haven't talked about at all. Um, uh, Ted, what's his name? Ted Levine. Ted, Ted Levine. Yeah, who is the Al Pacino's right hand man cop who was the killer in Silence of the Lambs. Oh yes. Yeah. Was she a big fat person? Yeah. That guy. <laughs> um he was actually asked to be Wayne Grow, uh, unfortunately, mm. you know, typecast for life and uh, oh, turned it down and asked to be one of the other parts. Um would have made a great Wayne Grow, of course, but yeah. Would have been actually been typecast for life 
if he'd done that. It's really hard to choose, isn't it? Like we said earlier, uh, you know, even when the credits are rolling at the start, there's just so many people in this movie, and, and you know, I guess yeah. maybe not at the time, but big actors playing quite small parts as well, just just to be yeah. in this movie. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, that a, was yeah. It's quite a testament, isn't it, to Michael Mann really that he was obviously a, a point in his career where anyone would work with him. Yeah. It's almost like Tarantino or a Scorsese kind oh, of Oh, yeah, yeah. Level I mean, incredible cast. to think that, like, Val Kilmer had already done Batman when this movie mm. came out. I mean, imagine Christian Bell doing that Val Kilmer role. You'd be like, what is he doing? Why is he being this little character in this in this movie outside these two? But, yeah, it's like um, just, to, just to be in a real serious movie. In fact, Val Hang turned on. down Batman Forever, uh, Batman and Robin, to do Heat. Right. This is after Batman? Yeah. Get yeah. fucked. Go on. <laughs> I believe Batman Forever was 93. Oh, I feel like man, it was 95, wasn't it? He must have shot it just before, perhaps. Yeah. He'd already it filmed it. Okay. So he had filmed it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. He knew he was Batman, put it that way. So he knew yeah. he was taking a supporting role. That's that is really interesting because he's, ba- he's barely anything in this in terms yeah. of... I think he knew what I think he knew what was going to happen with Batman Forever. He probably had a sense that it wasn't it wasn't the Batman it wasn't, it wasn't Tim Burton's Batman. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, next category is: uh, Would we like a remake, a sequel, or a gender swap of this movie? <laughs> gender swap. No one wants to watch a gender swap, do they? That would be that would be a movie, wouldn't it? Can we just pitch this? So it's a bunch of female criminals. Yeah, it's called In Heat. Freeze. Woke police. <laughs> uh. Sorry, boys. <laughs> nope. So the uh, final uh, category is the legacy of this film. I think this movie is alive and well in the conversation. I see memes of it on the internet. I still pe- people still talk about Heat. It's mm-hmm. not been forgotten. It's a classic. It lives on. Probably because Christopher Nolan did, ri- you know, rip it for Dark Knight and did talk about it quite a lot in the publicity tour. Or, Film people were bringing it up quite a lot in Dark Knight, yeah. and whenever Christopher Nolan does a movie, I feel like this movie gets comes out again and gets talked about. Obviously, the legacy is having these two, you know, big actors together. Yeah, yeah, possibly you know the greatest actors of their generation. Opposite and this each is other. their film. Yeah, I feel though that that was some somewhat kind of softened by it. Now I never saw it, but wasn't there another film? Was it Righteous Kill that they did together? Yeah. They've done another one as well no, since I- then, but yeah, no, I did. Have they? Yeah. yeah. I, I haven't seen either of those movies. Uh, so yeah. it just feels... Well, I don't think they were received particularly well, though, right? I think no. they kind of... Yeah. I'll tell you as well, Jim, one I wanted to tell you about, talk about the legacy of this movie. I, I feel like this movie was not big in the 90s. I think it came and went. I don't think people yeah. talked about it as like... A, and it was mm. only like at the end of the, the 2000s when it kind of... Maybe when it got a DVD release. I think when the DVD release came out, Right, and people were buying it and sharing it and watching it over and over again, because mm-hmm. it it came out. I think DVDs weren't a thing till like the nineteen nineteen ninety nine. I believe is when DVD players came out. Yeah, ni- ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand. Yeah. yeah, so I think it was when this was a big DVD movie, mm-hmm. and like the guys would get and watch around other guys' houses, and then it got big. But yeah, it didn't. Just, it, just I guys. It, <sighs> I don't think it made much of an impact though. Do you know what I mean? I think it came and went. I think yes. people were expecting a big boombastic film and this kind of slower paced storytelling. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you compare, you know, what was big at the time, 95, obviously Pulp, this is not Pulp Fiction, this isn't, that's the, obviously the biggest movie of 94 and it, this is much slower kind of, dare I say, long and boring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't think it was... Oh, it'd be interesting to know how the film was marketed as well because I'm assuming obviously Pacino and De Niro are big names but then, you know, what did the trailer have in it? Was it just all the, the action sequences and... No, I remember at the time it was like, yeah, Pacino, De Niro, and people were pissed off they only had that one cafe scene together. Right, okay. That they weren't yeah. like in the movie yeah. more because it was marketed out, this is a big movie with her together and people sure. didn't like that, yeah, there was only one scene. All right, well, that uh, wraps it up. Um, thank you for listening. I mean, um, we're not going to score we, the um, movie or do anything like that. But go on. I think what? we just get overall opinion. Uh, obviously, we'll on the movie as a whole. It. Oh yeah, the well, first thing was long. Yeah, what was the uh, what was the overall feeling? So some of dude it? comes up to you in the street, fish, and goes, "Yeah, mate of yours, regular guy who you might work with wherever it is you work." Fish, I, I, should I watch this movie? Should I watch this movie for heat? 
how long have you got? <laughs> It's not Al anymore. It's Dunk. Dunkachino? Don't mind if I do. What's my name? Dunkachino. It's a whole new game. Dunkachino. You want creamy goodness? I'm your friend. Say hello to my chocolate blend. Attica, who I lucky like. This whole trial is out of sight. They put me back in with hazelnut too. Caramel swirl. I know it was you. Everyone wants my Dunkachino. Can't get enough of my Dunkachino. Kids from 7 to 17 lining up for my Dunkachino. What's my name? Dunkachino. Dunkachino.